It's a great uh, pleasure to start this afternoon with uh, what is going to be a series of uh, five lectures and hopefully also sufficient time for discussion uh, of each of those topics. And the background to this is that uh, about a year ago, I can't remember exactly when, uh, somehow I got a hold of uh, this book uh, that is also shown up there uh, by Richard Ford Tennyson, uh, titled Darwinian Agriculture, or How Understanding Evolution Can Improve Agriculture. And uh, without having read it, uh, what intrigued me first was the, the headings of the chapters. And uh, I just read a few of those because uh, we can understand that uh, they are quite intriguing. Uh, they are like, uh, what do we need from agriculture? That's an interesting question by itself. Or, uh, what won't work? Or another chapter is called, uh, Selfish Genes, Sophisticated Plans, and How Us Are Ecosystems. Or another chapter is called, Stop Evolution Now. And there's a bunch of more of those. Um, and as I got to read the book, uh, I started uh, taking, uh, scribbling in the book, making notes here and there, and that's usually a sign that when you read a book and you do this, uh, it must be somehow interesting to you. It, it doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with what is written in the book, but it makes you think. And I think uh, that is the main purpose of this book. And those of you who haven't had a chance to, to read it, uh, I think irrespective of listening to the lectures, uh, uh, I would highly recommend to find the time to read it uh, and uh, also then provide any feedback to the author of the book on what you think uh, he should uh, reconsider when he writes the next edition of this book. So I'm very pleased that uh, Ford Dennison uh, has agreed to come here for a week uh, to give us this opportunity. Uh, he is uh, currently uh, an adjunct professor uh, of Ecology, Evolution and Behavior at the University of Minnesota. And before that, uh, uh, he taught for many years uh, crop ecology at the University of California in Davis, where he had also been, I think, a student or postdoc of, uh, uh, post of Paul Blumis. And that's actually where I met for, for the first time more than 10 years ago, in 2001. Uh, he invited me to come to Davis and give a presentation in the seminar that he had organized there. Uh, and it was interesting also because uh, uh, the questions that I received, and some of them I probably couldn't answer properly. So now is the time to pay back. And I'm looking forward to the first of these lectures. There will be four more coming. Uh, two on Monday, Monday 9 o'clock, and at 1.15, and two on Tuesday at the same time. But, uh, Richard Ford wants to start today with uh, the first uh, topic, uh, which is about uh, improving our nature. So you'll give what I think will be about 30 minutes, 35 or 40, whatever, uh, lecture, and then we'll have hopefully some time left for discussion. But irrespective of that, I would like to encourage anyone of you who wants to have further discussion with him, despite the program that we already made for him for the coming days, approach him and uh, find time to talk to him, or even better, uh, approach him to show him some of the work that you are doing uh, and uh, uh, seek his feedback on it. Richard, or Ford, I keep saying Richard, his real preferred name is Ford Tennyson. So please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for that nice introduction. Unfortunately, I discovered a few minutes ago the real reason that I was invited here. Uh, there's a sign out front that says the jury was established with the cooperation of Ford. There's some other, <laughs> some other text as well, but uh, that, was the, that was the important part. So uh, I'm afraid uh, that, that wasn't me. So, Many people, when they hear that I've written a book titled Darwinian Agriculture, assume that the book is primarily about 
evolution of pesticide resistance or evolution of herbicide resistance. And certainly, uh, ongoing evolution of, of uh, insect pests and weeds and so on is a, a serious problem for agriculture. The uh, picture on the, on the bottom shows uh, glyphosate resistant uh, giant ragweed, which uh, evolved in, in uh, Roundup Ready corn, where they were relying uh, perhaps too much on, on the glyphosate as the, the main weed control method. And then the graph on the top is the uh, increase in the frequency of herbicide resistance, uh, resistance to a bunch of different uh, chemical herbicides, and each with its own its own separate color. So that certainly is is an important topic and, and one that has been covered very well by some other people. So I really only spent one chapter, the stop evolution chapter. Stop Evolution Now chapter, uh, talking about that with, with some brief mention of related topics in other chapters. But the main focus of the book uh, is really on the implications of past evolution for yield potential, a topic that I hope will be of interest to, to many of you here. And I have a couple of quotations to sort of summarize my, my views on that. Uh, Charles Darwin was a, a big admirer of plant breeders and pointed out the amazing accomplishments and things that plant breeders have been able to accomplish in back in his day um, in just a few years or, or decades and, and with a limited amount of land, but then pointed out that natural selection has been operating worldwide and has been operating for millions of years. And he therefore suggested that natural selection is, is superior to man's feeble efforts as nature is to art, which is thought to be the only sentence that simultaneously offended both plant breeders and artists. But there are limitations to uh, natural selection. This is good because that means there are still plenty of opportunities despite billions of years of evolution of the wild ancestors of rice. There are still uh, great opportunities for improvement uh, by humans, as, as you're all aware. And one of the ways that there's those opportunities for improvement is, is summarized here by Case DeWitt, pointing out that there's nothing in the process of evolution that has any aspect of community behavior as a goal. And yet what we care about in agriculture is not the relative uh, Darwinian fitness of individual plants, their relative success in competing against each other. What we really care about is how a whole community of, of plants uh, growing together uh, produces grain, and how much resources they use in the process, and how much yield stability there is, and so on. And those are all things that are, are functions not just of the individual plant, but of their, their interactions in the community. So to sort of illustrate these points with a specific example, suppose somebody gave you this plant and didn't know anything about it, and you took a cross section of the, of the stem, and right away you noticed that there are these air channels running the length of the stem. And not only that, but there's a superized layer which would block the uh, diffusion of oxygen across that layer. Now I think it'd be quite reasonable to look at this and say, huh, what's the function of these air channels and of this gas diffusion barrier. And if you were um, as smart as you all are, you'd probably figure out that this probably was an adaptation to growing in flooded soils, and the vertical channels provided a diffusion pathway for oxygen down into the roots, and the superized layer prevented that oxygen from leaking out before it got to the roots. But even if you weren't able to figure that out, Maybe you're a chemist or something. Um, even if you couldn't, couldn't figure that out, it you certainly wouldn't say, oh, it probably doesn't have any function. Because if you think about this from an evolutionary uh, perspective, you realize that you know, this kind of anatomy, however it arose, there have to be 
a large number of possible mutations that would make the sumerized layer go away or that would make the air channels disappear, those mutations must have arisen over and over again over the evolutionary history of this plant. And so you would have repeatedly over the course of evolution competition between plants that have these air channels and plants that don't. And obviously the ones that do have the air channels won, not just once, but over and over again in competition. So it must be serving some useful function from the plant's point of view. This is where the plant grows. And this is uh, the headwaters of the, of the uh, Mississippi River. Uh, a few hours drive from where I live in, in Minnesota. And this, whoops, this is wild rice, which is not related, it's not in the rice up at all. It's a cold tolerant uh, plant that, that grows at the edge of, of lakes and it was a, a major source of grain for the American Indians and is still, still harvested uh, by them and, and sold at uh, very high prices. And so if you look at this, you'll notice that it has very low plant diversity. You know, it's, it's almost a monoculture. And so you can see this you know, here in this natural lake and ask yourself, what's the function of this low plant diversity? You know, does it, does it increase productivity? Does it increase stability over years? Does it confer uh, you know, resistance to, to invasion by, by pests? What's the function of this low diversity? And that would be a dumb question. Because in contrast to the individual wild rice plants, where different genotypes have competed against each other over and over again over the course of evolution, Lakes with high plant diversity and lakes with low plant diversity haven't competed against each other in the same way that plants compete against each other. So we haven't had the same kind of repeated competitive testing of this low diversity versus high diversity. Uh, and even if somehow there was that sort of competition, the diversity of plants in a lake isn't inherited by little baby lakes with the same kind of uh, fidelity that traits uh, are passed from parent to offspring via DNA. So we have this, this, this argument that the traits that you see in plants have been shaped by repeated competition against alternative versions of themselves and what we see is the winners of repeated competition, but you don't have the same kind of mechanism controlling the overall organization of natural ecosystems. Things like the number of species, you know, we don't have a mechanism that's going to, uh, you know, if, if the ecosystem has too many orchids for stability, you know, get rid of one of the orchids. Uh, things like spatial patterns, for example, or, or patterns over time. So we're, we're, those are less likely to have been improved by nature than the individual adaptations. Put it another way, Past natural selection has improved trees much more reliably than it's improved forests. And I'm just showing the, the, uh, the comparison between the two here. So this leads to the first of my three proposed principles of Darwinian agriculture. These are here in chapter four after introductory chapters on agriculture and on, on evolution. And the first of these statements perhaps would be of, of most interest and, and perhaps controversy here, namely, given that uh, repeated competition over millions of years, past natural selection is unlikely to exist simple trade-off free improvements. And I have another couple of um, suggestions that I won't talk about as much in this series. First, that uh, not only natural selection, but nothing, has consistently improved the overall organization of natural ecosystems, and therefore they're uh, not necessarily a good model for agricultural ecosystems. And finally, my last chapter is a, a strong call for the benefits of diversity, but recognizing that there are trade-offs 
that diversity is going to reduce risks, but to get that risk reduction, you may have to, to sacrifice uh, falling a bit short of the, the maximum uh, possible benefits. So these are the, the titles of the, the five talks. Uh, maybe I'll have to change a bit since I'm, I'm learning so much uh, talking to people here. I've really been impressed by the, the uh, scientists that I've met with. And today's talk is sort of introductory and titled Improving on Nature. Two main uh, points to the, the talk today. First, the power of natural selection uh, in support of my, my claim that simple trade-off free improvements uh, are, are not likely to have been missed. And then the second part, which offers uh, opportunities for improvements through, through plant breeding, uh, modern and, and traditional, is talking briefly about the kinds of improvements that have not been made by natural selection and which therefore are the easiest sorts of improvements for us to make. So turning to the power of natural selection, natural selection can only select among the genetic diversity that's out there. So the first question is, okay, if you're saying that, that uh, simple alternatives all of the simple alternatives to existing genotypes have arisen and been tested by natural selection. That's making an assumption about you know, the rate of mutation leading to those, those alternative genotypes for testing. And so how often do mutations arise? Well, about 10 to the negative 8 per base is, is considered the approximate rate. So if we take 10 to the negative 8 and multiply it by the number of plants in the Philippines, we get an estimate that for any single base mutation you care to name, there should be about 8,000 plants in the Philippines that have that mutation. So for single base mutations, the mutation rate really is a significant limitation on the ability of natural selection to make improvements. However, and that's indicated by By this top line here, uh, the horizontal axis is the number of years that it takes for a genotype to arise. It's a log scale, so the, tip, the six is a million years. And basically, for single base mutations, they arise instantly and uh, sweep through the population at you know, a rate determined by their, their relative fitness. But if you want some genetic improvement that requires two independent mutations, each with a probability of 10 to the minus 8, we're going to have to wait on the average, you know, 5 million years or so. Kind of a long time. So single mutations, easy. Two simultaneous mutations, much less likely. And therefore, natural selections, improvements typically happen through a series of steps. Here I've illustrated a simple pattern of four genotypes that are linked together in a network where each of the steps in this network is a single mutation. So if we start with the uh, ancestral population that's highlighted, that's going to be a large population, and so by the previous argument, it should regularly spin off mutants of both of these single mutation uh, variants. But if those mutants have lower fitness than their parent, indicated here by the lower height of the column, those mutant populations will never build up to high enough levels that they're likely to spin off this highest fitness uh, genotype. So even though that genotype at the right would have the highest fitness and would be you know, evolutionarily stable if it arose, you may not be able to get there from the ancestor. However, fitness is a function of genotype interactions with the environment. And so if there's a different pest that arrives, or the climate gets warmer, or you know, we have more drought, any of those things can change the relative fitness of different genotypes such that this 
intermediate genotype highlighted in, in yellow uh, would have higher fitness. It would therefore, in you know, 100 or 1,000 years, become the predominant genotype. It would then spit off uh, the high fitness genotype and the population would go to this highest fitness. So that's a kind of theory, evolutionary theory, but in fact, with the advent of molecular biology, we have actual data on this sort of thing, at least for some uh, moderately complex evolutionary improvements. This particular example that's shown here is the evolution of antibiotic resistance in a human pathogen. And this is you know, evolution that happened, it's not theoretical. Genotypes are out there, both the, the ancestor and the evolved, highly antibiotic resistant descendants. And if you look at the uh, genetic basis of this, it had to take at least five separate mutations to get to the high uh, resistance, high fitness genotype. And so what Weinreich at all asked is, okay, five steps, uh, there's 100 is that right? Possible pathways that you could go you know, by, by five steps, which, which ones are, are most likely. And so what they did was to make uh, genetically engineer all of the intermediate, possible intermediate genotypes, measure their fitness, and then they plotted them here in this network. So starting here, this uh, possible mutant only has very slightly higher fitness, so it's not terribly likely to have increased by natural selection. But this mutant has more than 10 times the fitness of its parent. So once that mutant arose, uh, it would increase pretty quickly in an environment where the bacteria were exposed to the antibiotic. And following a similar logic, they were able to suggest that this highlighted pathway is though not the only possible pathway to the high fitness uh, result at right, the most probable pathway. Evolutionary biologists, uh, some of us anyway, like to use the metaphor of a fitness landscape at the lower left. And the idea here is that natural selection can make uh, fairly complex improvements if it can do it in a series of steps, and if each of those steps represents an increase in Darwinian fitness, that is the relative uh, survival and reproduction relative to, to other genotypes. And that's the way I've drawn it here, continuously increasing fitness over a, a path of several uh, mutations. But I'm more interested in plants, and I imagine uh, most of you are as well. So let me just uh, finish my section on the power of natural selection with examples of what has happened, the, the kinds of improvements that natural selection has made in the past. And all of these examples will be for a kind of flow of water grass, which I imagine doesn't grow in Asia, right? It came from Asia. Um, so this first uh, figure is Actually, from the book, it's a picture I took at the, the weed day at UC Davis. And it shows uh, water grass resistant to uh, different herbicides. I've highlighted two of the resistant uh, genotypes with, with you know, very good growth with exposure to, to uh, two different herbicides. And we know that the ancestor of uh, the kind of coral water grass was susceptible to uh, these herbicides. And in fact, if you look at the, this species in soil collected from organic farms, where the herbicides, they weren't exposed to herbicides, you can see that they're still, still susceptible. Well, this is certainly a, a problem for rice growers in California. This evolution took only a few years in some fields. But, Herbicide resistance is actually a fairly easy thing to evolve. You know, even humans have figured out how to put herbicide resistance in the plants. 
Floating tolerance is uh, also something that humans have made progress in, but it's maybe a bit trickier. And we know that the ancestor of the kind of total water grass was barnyard grass, which is not flooding tolerant, readily killed by submergence. And so before barnyard grass could invade uh, rice fields 2,000 years ago, or whatever it was, it started, it had to involve flooding tolerance. And illustrating this here, this is the, one of the research fields at UC Davis with different water depths, and you can see the deepest water, you know, giving the best weed control, though not necessarily the best yield. But herbicide resistance and flooding tolerance are actually relatively easy compared to fooling farmers, because farmers are smart, and they uh, noticed the red stems of the first uh, water grass uh, inherited from its ancestor barnyard grass and ran out there with hoes or whatever tools they were using and removed those red stem plants. And so only the mutant water grass with green stems has survived to the present day. But there's more to it than that. Uh, Spencer Barrett actually assessed a large number of visible traits in barnyard grass, water grass, and a traditional rice variety, and plotted them as a two-dimensional graph. And so what we see is the ancestor, barnyard grass, over here, and then here, water grass, mixed in with rice, looking more like rice than it looks like its own recent ancestor. So all three of these examples, the, the herbicide resistance, the flooding tolerance, and the rice mimicry, these are all things that have happened just in the few thousand years that rice has been cultivated in Asia.